Hello, my name is Dr. John Fagan, and I'm uh, pleased to be able to talk about this uh, topic. And I thank the American um, College of Osteopathic Physicians of California for allowing me the opportunity. So, the uh, one of the old adages in medical school is when you think of when you hear footprints, you think of horses, because it's the you know common things being common. Uh, well, the Ehlers-Danlos Society has used the, have uh, taken the symbol of the zebra to uh, show that they, uh, the idea that this um, uh, disease is, is uh, much more prevalent than previously thought. So the Ellers Denlow Society, uh, where a lot of the information is compiled uh, as far as publications concerning this um, disease, uh, is exists to improve the education and support research for Ehlers-Denlos Syndrome and the hypermobile spectrum disorder. Uh, and I have said that they've used the zebra as their symbol. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive into this. So there are uh, three main objectives of this talk. The first is just to understand the prevalence of the disease, uh, this disease in primary care. Number two is to be able to recognize this disease in your own patient population and make a preliminary diagnosis. And third is to understand treatment options and resources that may be available for uh, helping these patients improve quality of life. The biggest take home point though is to be able to recognize the symptoms and signs of hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, be able to identify these patients in your practice because it makes a big difference in their medical treatment. So with respect to the relevance of this to primary care, according to the American Journal of Human Genetics, um, the prevalence of EDS hypermobility is about 2% of the population, which actually makes it more common than rheumatoid arthritis. So if the family physician has about 2,000 patients in their panel, that would be about 40 patients. Now, a lot of these patients are going to be asymptomatic um, because they're, it's part of a wide spectrum. So that turns out to be about 20 patients that would be symptomatic with comorbidities uh, in a typical uh, primary care practice. So there has been different classification systems over the years for Ehlers-Danlos disease. And um, based on the fact that we have much better genetic data now, they've, uh, geneticists have been able to identify uh, 13 different types of Ehlers-Danlos disease. And there was a large international symposium that gathered in May of 2017 that basically um, uh, codified these um, different uh, types of Ehlers-Danlos disease. And um, of the 13 types, the they came up, it, it, all of the 12, excuse me, 12 of the 13 types have genetic testing uh, that they've been able to identify. Uh, and the, uh, the 13th type, which is the hypermobile type, which is by far the most common kind, has yet to identify a genetic basis for this. So they came up with a clinical criteria, which we'll go over uh, as part of this talk. And when I applied the new criteria of this symposium to my practice, I exactly, I picked up about 25 new patients uh, just from my own practice. Uh, so uh, they're out there and we just have to look for them. So this is the classification system of the 2017 International Symposium. And uh, you can see the 13 different types. The letters off to the side indicate if they're autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Um, again, uh, 12 of these types have genetic testing to verify the existence um, of these 13 types, 10 are very rare, and most geneticists will never see them. Um, of the remaining three, there are three that um, are out there that you know we would we may see the classic EDS, um, the vascular EDS, and hypermobile EDS. And of those three, uh, hypermobile EDS is probably 80% of those cases. So by far. Uh, the most common, and that's what we're going to really be talking about uh, in this uh, talk. So there's a set of criteria that has been uh, used to um, determine hypermobility, as is the most uh, obvious manifestation of this disease. 
and it's called the Byton criteria. So this criteria um, is used to assess the presence of hypermobility. They use five joint areas in the body. Uh, they use the fifth fingers on both sides of the hands. They use the thumb on both sides, the elbows on both sides, the knees on both sides, and the spine as, uh, as a point. So each hypermobile joint equals one point for a total of nine possible points. Some cases are obvious, but it helps to have a small goniometer to measure uh, some of the joints um, uh, to give you more confidence in your uh, objective criteria. So to determine if someone is hypermobile, the fifth finger is passively extended to 90 degrees. If it can get to 90 degrees, then that's considered a point and you get one point for each side. For the thumb, if your thumb can touch the forearm by flexing the wrist, not extending it, but flexing the wrist, touching the thumb to the forearm is a point on each side. If the elbow extends to more than 10 degrees more than normal, is a point for each side, and then your knees extend the knees to 10 degrees more than usual is a point for each side. And then the spine, if you can touch the ground with the palms of your hands without bending the knees, that is a point as well. So generalized hypermobility is considered six points over nine or higher. Um, as we'll talk about, the results may be affected by the age as joints uh, in these patients often stiffen prematurely so that the uh, clinical diagnosis allows the possibility of patient history to add to the physical exam to be able to come to a determination uh, as to the presence of hypermobility. So genetics, uh, hypermobile EDS is thought to be an autosomal dominant. Uh, it's, thought, it's thought to be caused at least in part by genetic deficiencies in protein production, which make up connective tissue, and this gives us the, the most obvious uh, manifestation of the loose ligaments and the hypermobile joints. There is no genetic test, as we discussed, to, to confirm hypermobile EDS, so this remains a clinical diagnosis. So first we're going to just talk briefly about the classical and vascular type. Um, we may run across these. Uh, the classical type has uh, generalized joint hypermobility and they have extremely hyperextensible skin. That's quite fragile. They have easy bruising and atrophic scarring. So we see a picture of an atrophic scar, which is very paper-like thin. And these patients can be uh, determined or the diagnosis can be confirmed by the genetic testing of COL5A1 and COL5A2. And this is a picture, picture of the uh, extremely hyperextensible skin of a classic type Ehlers-Danlos uh, patient. Vascular type uh, EDS is a rare disorder, also manifested by hypermobility, but it, the, in this particular type, the vascular system is affected with vascular aneurysms, dissections, and ruptures. Um, there is uh, also, you can have rupture of other viscera, including the colon and uterus. This is the most serious form of EDS and it has significant complications and has a uh, altered lifespan with the median age of death is 48 years old. This can be confirmed by genetic testing COL3A1. And this is a picture of the uh, vascular type EDS with the very paper thin skin and very prominent blood vessels. So pretty rare, may never run into that, but it's good to be aware. So this is a um, diagnostic checklist that was produced by the Ehlers-Danlos Society based on the International Consortium um, of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Related Disorders to allow us to make a clinical diagnosis of hypermobile EDS. So since it's a clinical diagnosis, it consists of uh, history and physical exam uh, findings, as well as echocardiographic findings. And it's divided into three categories. There are criterion. 
Each one of those criterion must be fulfilled in order for the patient to have hypermobile EDS. The, uh, and we'll go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. Looks like a lot on this page, but after you use this form a few times, it actually isn't that uh, complicated. Um, uh, and we'll go through each one of these. You can see uh, pictures of the hypermobile joints of the, the fifth finger, the thumb, elbow, the knees, and um, person bending at the waist. So let's first talk about generalized joint hypermobility. So the general <clears throat> clinical diagnosis has stated uh, you need the presence of all three criteria. Uh, number one is the generalized hypermobility by the Biden criteria, which we've talked about, physical exam criteria, and then there needs to be exclusion of other uh, inherited or acquired connective tissue disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or other genetic diseases that are usually quite rare. So with respect to criterion one, uh, we're going to apply the Biden score. So a, a, per, a person can satisfy criteria one for the diagnosis if they have six or greater Biden score in children and adolescents. And then weighing for age, uh, they can have five or more in uh, any one past puberty up to age 50 and they can have four or more over the age, if they're over the age of 50. So if they have those, if they have those things, um, as far as the number of hypermobile joints, then they would um, satisfy criterion one. Now, because some patients don't satisfy the criteria due to age, uh, they allow uh, that if the Biden score is one point below average, excuse me, below age, uh, that two or more of the following historical facts may be selected to meet the criterion. So if two of these five are present, they can still meet the criteria if they are one point below the age um, uh, numbers. So can you ever, these are questions that you can ask your patients, could you, um, can you, can you now or ever place your hands on the flat on the floor without bending your knees? Could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? As a child, did you, you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange shapes? As a child or teenager, did your shoulder or knee di kneecap dislocate on more than one occasion? And uh, did you consider yourself double jointed? So if two of these exist, then they can add to the criteria to satisfy criteria one. So criteria two consists of three categories. Uh, the first category is based on physical exam and echocardiogram criteria. And there are 12 physical exam uh, features that the patient has to meet five of these um, to be considered having uh, fulfilling this criteria. So, um, and we'll talk about those in more detail. The uh, this, the second uh, category is if you have a positive family history of a first degree relative with hypermobile EDS based on the current clinical criteria. And then the third category is you have to have at least one of the following uh, chronic musculoskeletal pain in two or more limbs, chronic widespread pain like a fibromyalgia type of pain for more than three months, or recurrent joint dislocations uh, or joint instability in the absence of trauma. So. For criterion two to be uh, satisfied, at least two of the uh, features must be present. So either A and B or A and C or B and C. And we'll see what that looks like here in a second. So for criterion uh, two part A, and we'll revisit that checklist again because it, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, physical exam findings here, but once you look at it again, it'll, it'll come to you. So one is unusually soft or velvety skin, and after you see a f or recognize a few of these patients, you'll be able to see the difference in the skin in these patients. Mild skin hyperextensibility uh, is one of the criteria, and that is um, really defined as uh, three centimeters 
at the sides of the neck and then three centimeters if you pull over the kneecap uh, if you pull that up and you saw the picture of the classic type so that would not be consistent with the hypermobile type if they had that kind of skin uh, extensibility so uh, stretch marks on the back groins thigh breasts and or abdomen uh, and men or women um, without a history of significant gain or, or, or loss of body fat or weight uh, is a, is a one of the physical findings. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a, a podiatric sign that is a bilateral pyusogenic papules of the heels, which I'll show you pictures of. Uh, recurrent or multiple abdominal hernias may be present. There's atrophic scarring involving at least two sites and without the formation of the typical uh, purplish hemosideric scars that is seen in classical EDS. So this is continued of those potential 12 signs, at least remember five have to be present. Uh, pelvic floor, rectal or uterine prolapse in children or uh, non-pregnant women without a history of morbid obesity and also in men for rectal prolapse. Uh, the next item is dental crowding or high or narrow palate. The next is arachnodactyly, which is defined as um, what's called a walker sign where you can have the patient grab their wrist with their opposite hand and try to touch the fifth finger with the thumb not the index but the fifth finger with the thumb on both sides if that's positive then that, that can be used as a as a uh, identifying uh, mark trait the positive thumb sign is on both sides if they can flex the thumb across the palm of the hand and have the tip of the thumb extend beyond the uh, palm that's considered a positive sign the next item is arm span to height ratio if it's greater than 1.05. So you just measure that compared to their height. And the last two are echocardiographic criteria, mitral valve prolapse, which is mild or greater based on strict echocardiographic criteria, and uh, aortic root dilatation with a Z-score of greater than uh, or equal to two. So Z-score just determines, uh, it, it takes into account the size of the patient. So this is a, a picture of the pyusogenic papules. These are small whitish uh, papules on the, uh, on the heels that occur with weight bearing and they're thought to represent small fat globules uh, from connective tissue that's not holding them in place. This is a picture of an atrophic scar in the middle from a previous surgery and then also this is a picture on the lower abdomen of a patient and you can see the striae uh, or stretch marks on the right lower corner of the picture. So uh, we go back to the to the worksheet. We've gone through uh, criterion one and uh, the first part of criterion two. And you would just check the boxes for those things that uh, to see if they meet the criteria. Uh, so we're going to go on to feature B and C. Uh, remember you need in criteria two, you need only two of those three features to be present to be able to uh, be consistent with the diagnosis. So for criterion two part B, if you have a positive family history of one or more first degree relatives independently uh, meeting the current criteria for hypermobile EDS. So they have to meet the criteria for hypermobile EDS based on the international consortium criteria. So that is, again, is a first degree relative, either a sibling or parent or child. Criterion two, part C, or the third feature. Uh, only one of these has to be present, musculoskeletal pain in two or more limbs, recurring daily for at least three months, or chronic widespread pain, like a fibromyalgia type pain for th three months or recurrent joint dislocations or joint instability in the absence of trauma. Any one of those can fulfill part C of that criteria. So then the last criterion, all of the following must be present. So number one, absence of unusual skin fragility or hyperextensibility, which should prompt consideration of other types of EDS. Number two is exclusion of other heritable or acquired connective tissue disease. 
including autoimmune rheumatologic conditions. Um, so oftentimes these patients have already seen a rheumatologist um, and have had these types of uh, diagnoses ruled out. Um, in addition, uh, if the patient does have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't, and they're hypermobile, uh, they could still have hypermobile EDS. You just can't use the chronic widespread pain or the joint pain criteria as a, um, that can't be counted toward the diagnosis in this situation. And then the third uh, bullet point is the exclusion of other diagnoses that may also include joint hypermobility, um, which include um, neuromuscular disorders, other hereditary disorders of connective tissue, such as Marfan's, Louis Dietz syndrome, uh, and other skeletal dysplasias like osteogenesis, Im, Im, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, usually these can be, uh, these patients have already been diagnosed or um, have seen specialists regard to their particular conditions. Um, so I've not seen this as a, as a huge issue. So going that back then to our, our checklist, that would be criterion three. And then, um, uh, you can, if they satisfy all three criteria, then you can uh, give them the clinical diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So uh, currently, again, there's no genetic test. So uh, if anybody questions your diagnosis, uh, any other physicians, um, you can show them this documentation and uh, try to educate them as well as to the current criteria. So if patients, uh, there's a, it's, uh, quite a few patients are actually hypermobile, but they don't really meet those, uh, all that clinical criteria that we just went through. So they are to be really to be grouped into what's called a hypermobile spectrum disorder. Um, the, the international consortium wanted to make sure that just because you, you might not have uh, fulfilled the criteria that you got ignored and didn't get treated. So they wanted to include all these other people, at least until they can get better genetic testing. So, um, and, and an important point with these people is that even though they don't have uh, hypermobile EDS diagnosis, they should be treated with the same way, looking for the same comorbidities. So a lot of these patients um, will have lots of the other comorbidities like chronic pain, for example, but won't meet the clinical criteria for hypermobile EDS, but they're still part of the spectrum. And the spectrum goes from patients that are completely asymptomatic to totally disabling. This is a slide from the Ehlers-Danlos Society that uh, just kind of um, puts together the different categories of hypermobile spectrum disorders. Um, so you can have localized or generalized joint hypermobility, um, and you can have even just peripheral joint hypermobility with just a few joints uh, and you're still part of the hypermobile spectrum disorder. Usually you don't have musculoskeletal involvement with that. Um, so the bottom line is you can categorize or subcategorize patients. Uh, clinically, it probably doesn't matter that much as long as they are understood to have the hypermobile spectrum part of the spectrum. So now we're going to focus mostly on hypermobile EDS and um, the hypermobile spectrum disorder, the natural history of the manifestations of these patients. So first, they have a hypermobile phase, um, which is hypermobile joints, frequent sprains, subluxations, and dislocations. Usually this is from childhood to the mid-20s. Then they generally turn into a pain phase, which is usually from the teenage years through the 40s. Uh, they can often get uh, generalized pain that's often diagnosed with fibromyalgia. They have chronic musculoskeletal pain, pelvic pain in women, headaches and fatigue. And then the stiffness phase, they get a generalized reduction in joint mobility, significant reduction in function due to disabling pain, stiffness of joints, chronic fatigue. They have reduced muscle mass, loss of proprioceptions. Uh, if patients present that are older, they often don't mention that they have generalized joint hypermobility in their past. Um, and they often don't remember upon questioning, even until they ask their relatives. So if you see patients that are older that have a lot of the comorbidities, they still may be part of the hypermobile spectrum disorder uh, because they're, they're, 
joints may be very stiff by the time you see them in their older years. So that's kind of a natural history of how th these patients progress over time. So let's look at the comorbidities. So first is the, just the generalized hypermobility. Uh, this oftentimes can be quite disabling, uh, both for teenagers and as people get older, with unstable joints, subluxations, and pain. They're often, uh, you know, felt they feel like they're clumsy. They, they, you know, they fall a lot when they're kids, um, spraining and injuring uh, joints, um, and a lot of it's just due to their unstable joints. So this is a video of one of our patients that can uh, dislocate her shoulder and bring it right back in again. So uh, these can be, oftentimes this can happen while they're just reaching for something or uh, just rolling over in bed and uh, they can be quite painful. Ooh, that, that was a, wasn't a great sound. This is another example of uh, hypermobile elbows. And she apparently won a talent contest in grade school. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to watch these. Pain is a comorbid condition. Uh, it's a, usually a combination of the musculoskeletal pain and the neuropathic type of pain. And that can range from very mild to severely disabling. Fatigue, uh, many patients have chronic fatigue syndrome type symptoms, uh, affects their daily function. Usually it's exacerbated with increased activity. And often these patients have to limit their activities on a daily basis to uh, conserve their energy to be able to function as best they can. So there's a very common to have gastrointestinal disorders. There's a higher incidence of hiatal hernia and GERD. Uh, there's also a higher incidence of IBS with chronic diarrhea and or constipation. And gastroparesis, uh, gut motility issues occur with this, as we'll talk about a little bit more lately, or excuse me, later on. Um, so this is it's one of the important things to remember as part of a comorbid condition because it's oftentimes not thought of uh, unless you're a diabetic or have other neurologic conditions. So dysautonomia is um, kind of an imbalance of the involuntary nervous system. So these patients have a lot of increased incidence of inappropriate tachycardia. They have uh, POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome where they get an inappropriate uh, fast heart rate with positional change. They have orthostatic intolerance, often with GI motility disorders as discussed. They also have excessive sensory perception like smells and sounds. Uh, so they're, they sometimes are very irritated or agitated with normal sounds um, and smells. They can smell things that other people can't and tasting as well is one of the things that they have kind of a superpower with. Uh, they also have difficulty with temperature regulation. A lot of these people are cold all the time or they don't, they can't really tolerate heat above 75 or 80 degrees. They get uh, very, uh, they get sweaty, they uh, have inappropriate tachycardia, can also affect their function. Premature osteoarthritis can occur, thought to occur from hypermobility and chronic microtrauma to the joints. Um, I've had one patient who had jaw surgery on her temporal mandibular joint uh, when she was in her 20s, and the oral surgeon said she had the, looked like she had a jaw of an 80 year old. Headaches are very common as well. There's a higher incidence of migraines uh, in this population. There's a higher incidence of Chiari 1 malformation where the cerebellar tonsils are actually uh, down through the foramen magnum. Even a couple of millimeters can cause symptoms. They can have cranial cervical instability, which is instability at the base of the skull where it attaches to the spine. 
and you can have uh, cervical spine instability where you have uh, ligamentous laxity in the cervical cord that can cause uh, certain types of cervical medullary syndromes. I'll talk a little bit more about this. They also have a higher incidence of CSF uh, leaks from the weak dura and the diverticula of the dura that can occur with the connective tissue problem. These headaches are typically positional, which get worse with uh, standing or sitting from a lying position. Uh, as the CSF fluid drops or the pressure drops, it can cause that type of a headache. And because there's a higher incidence of degenerative disc disease of the cervical spine, there's muscle contraction type headaches as well. So all of these things um, can occur and need to be thought about as a differential diagnosis. So it's a video of a patient who um, was thought to be psychogenic type seizures, but in, um, has been shown that this is cervical spine instability. She's a patient who has hypermobile EDS. So this uh, patient is being evaluated now for uh, possible surgical intervention uh, to stabilize her spinal cord. If I grab her neck, I can stop the attack. Are you filming? Yeah. Okay, now if I let go, it's going to start right back up again. It's just a matter of seconds. Oh my gosh, it's easy to pull it up again and see. Oh my baby, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. See that? Yeah, it makes a difference pulling her neck okay. or being upside down. Okay. Uh, yeah, she needs something. Okay. So there's also higher incidence of temporal mandibular joint and dental issues. Um, this is thought to occur from laxity and premature osteoarthritis of the temporal mandibular joint. Uh, you also get uh, significant dental issues. There are a higher incidence of periodontal disease um, in these patients due to thought to the weakness of the gums and friability of the oral mucosa. Uh, they can get spontaneous bleeding. It's also been shown that local anesthesia is frequently not effective in these patients, which um, can cause a fear and avoidance of preventive dental treatment because oftentimes the dentist has to wait a long time and give them multiple uh, shots to uh, try to give adequate anesthesia. And I've had more than one patient tell me that they just had their dental work done without uh, any anesthesia because it just didn't work. Spine, we talked a little bit about that. There's also uh, postural kyphosis is very common. Cervical, lumbar, and thoracic spine joint laxity can cause chronic pain and uh, significant neurologic complications, all of which uh, eventually lead to decreased function and strength causing further disability. Many patients report friable vaginal and labial tissue in addition to painful intercourse. Uh, there's a higher incidence of pelvic organ, organ prolapse and can be significantly worse after childbirth. Interestingly, studies thus, show, thus far show no significant increased risk of complications during pregnancy or childbirth. I've had several of my patients um, go through pregnancy without significant complications. Might be the only good thing about this disease. Sleep studies with patients self-reporting uh, poor and non-restorative sleep is significantly higher than the general population. And the causes are thought to be multiple, including uh, pain, the dysautonomia with inappropriate tachycardia, depression, and uh, probably a higher incidence of sleep apnea as well. Mast cell disease, um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome is becoming more recognized in the general population. This refers to an increased number of mast cells in multiple tissues, leading to higher amounts of histamine and tryptase. So when these mast cells are activated inappropriately, the symptoms can include flushing, itching, 
recurrent hives and are thought to potentially cause a lot of the GI symptoms as well. It can also cause um, hypotension, which just adds to the dysautonomia. And it appears to be a higher incidence in the uh, uh, in the Ehlers-Danlos uh, population than the general population. Psychiatric, there's uh, depression, anxiety are significantly higher in the hypermobile EDS population. Sometimes it's hard to know what came first, you know, the chicken or the egg, but uh, the depression and anxiety can exacerbate underlying dysautonomy and pain as well. Uh, a lot of times when these patients are significantly anxious, their pain and dysautonomia symptoms uh, get worse as well. And due to difficulty in healthcare providers not being aware of the frequency of this problem, many providers have chalked up many of the comorbid symptoms to depression and anxiety, which leads to further worsening of the situation because the patients are not being treated, their underlying problems, they're being treated as anxiety and depression and they don't get better. So there, as we talked about, there's some neurologic compl uh, uh, complications as well. The cervical instability, st instability, there's cranial cervical instability, and this is caused by unstable axis of the skull on the first two cervical vertebral bodies, and that can result in a multitude of neurologic symptoms, including ataxia, numbness, tingling, and weakness of the arms and legs. And you can get chronic dystonia with tremors and clonic type movements. It's a video of a patient just at rest. This patient has chronic dystonia. So as might be expected, several studies have shown significant reduction in quality of life due to these multiple comorbidities. So super important to be able to recognize these patients in our practices. Typically, they've had several, uh, they have several associated comorbidities such as fibromyalgia, migraine, IBS, and chronic fatigue. Typically, these patients have significant reduced quality of life. A few quick, quick questions in these patients like that have fibromyalgia or migraines and IBS, just ask them as a kid, were you double jointed? Did you use to do things with your joints to entertain your friends or show off at parties? Uh, I've personally found that a significant number of patients answered yes. So not everybody will, but um, you can ask them these questions, and um, you'll be surprised, I think, at how many uh, fit this uh, fit this fit the bill for this. So at the time when you're recognizing this, you can do a quick exam, just using the Biden criteria. So you, it takes less than a minute probably to check their fingers, thumbs, elbows, knees, and bending over, and then you have to determine what step you're going to take. So if, if they are hypermobile you would have to decide if you have time to apply the diagnostic criteria at that office visit or say something like, I think I might know why you have so many symptoms and reschedule the patient to, a, to return at a separate time where you can spend more time in talking about it. This sometimes works and sometimes doesn't as they begin to wonder what you're asking for and what you're thinking about and they want to know uh, what you think their diagnosis is. So uh, each individual practitioner would just have to decide how they're going to do this. So the importance of making the diagnosis is twofold. First, it gives the patient validation that they're not crazy, as many have been referred to psychiatry without significant improvement in their symptoms. Second, it makes the physician think of the comorbidities associated that may lead to correct diagnosis uh, of these problems. Uh, for example, uh, gastroparesis is a common uh, problem that has been diagnosed uh, that several GI docs have missed because they weren't really uh, aware of the association with hypermobility. The primary care physician can then determine if they want to manage this patient or refer to a specialist. Uh, I believe the management of this problem can uh, be done by primary care with appropriate referrals, but that would be up to the individual uh, provider. Uh, I usually work with only one or two problems with each visit as they can be very time consuming. Um, for a first patient evaluation, I give at least 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes longer than that because they have so many symptoms. 
So let's talk about treatment options. Uh, pain is uh, one of the biggest problems. So physical modalities to stabilize individual joints and prevention of myofascial spasms, such as physical therapy, specifically protocols uh, that are uh, geared toward hypermobile uh, patients, which includes mainly the Muldowney protocol. Uh, our local uh, physical therapy department at Casa Colina uh, has done, one, done does wonders with these patients. Uh, myofascial release protocols can provide relief. Uh, splinting therapy, uh, braces for many joints are available, specific, hopefully with somebody that is, understands the hypermobile joints. Exercising really should be at low resistance and low impact with gradual increasing repetitions and not resist. Water, uh, heated water based exercises are usually very helpful. It takes a lot of the uh, uh, strain off the joints. Biofeedback can be helpful, improve sleep, can reduce pain. Um, scheduled use of Tylenol or PRN NSAIDs are helpful uh, for the joint dislocations and sublocations. Uh, opiates for this musculoskeletal pain can be used as a last resort, but short and long acting opiates are sometimes needed for severe causes of constant joint dislocations. Excuse me, cases of uh, constant joint, joint dislocations. Tramadol, uh, I usually start with that. It's thought to be the best initial approach. Muscle relaxants can be helpful for sleep and reduce myofascial spasm, but obviously can cause sedation if you use them during the day. The other type of pain is a neuropathic type of pain and is treated similar to how we would treat fibromyalgia. I usually start with duloxetine and either cyclobenzaprine or gabapentin. Uh, as to, they both help with sleep and have analgesic properties. Pregabalin can be very effective but can cause sedation and weight gain. Uh, you have to be careful with the use of duloxetine and tramadol as there's a higher incidence of serotonin syndrome. Tricyclic antidepressants uh, like low dose nortriptyline can be helpful but uh, they may exacerbate orthostatic intolerance so we have to be careful with that. There's a newer form of pain therapy called photobiomodulation that um, is laser-based therapy that has a specific wavelength to stimulate the mitochondria to produce ATP, which um, sets along a cascade of events of uh, reduced pain and improved healing. And there are some studies showing that that is also helpful. For treatment of fatigue, uh, exercise can be helpful in the proper conditions. Uh, you can use a Siberian ginseng, Stimulant medications such as fentramine can be useful for short-term use for chronic fatigue. Um, sometimes this medication makes a big difference in their functional ability and improved sleep can also help with fatigue. Treatment options for dysautonomia. Um, usually cardiovascular symptoms require further evaluation such as a cardiology evaluation uh, to try to differentiate between orthostatic intolerance and POTS. The difference is, is important because with orthostatic intolerance, usually you get a drop in the blood pressure with orthostasis followed by a ventral tachycardia. And this is treated with a volume expander like fludrocortisone or midodrin. Um, and the postural and POTS is treated with the beta blockers because you get an inappropriate tachycardia and then hypotension subsequently. Uh, normal, assuming normal kidney function and ejection fraction, weekly boluses of one to two liters of uh, normal saline can also be very helpful. And this is, uh, again, the POTS uh, caused by inappropriate tachycardia treated with a low-dose beta blocker. Inappropriate tachycardia thought to be, is thought to be a large contributor to insomnia as these patients get uh, kind of an adrenaline surge in the middle of the night, wake them, waking them up sometimes multiple times a night. And clonidine has actually been shown to be uh, fairly helpful for this as it can cause sedation and uh, uh, prevent some of the tachycardia. Again, we have to watch for hypotension. Headache, we usually just treat this as a usual migraine. Um, however, if it's, if it's consistent with migraines, if it's not, oftentimes they complain of pain at the base of the neck. So we have to look for things like carry one, cervical spine instability and cranial cervical instability and CSF leaks. So I usually ask the patients to make sure they're not positional headaches. Um, I will usually, if they haven't already had it done, get an MRI of the brain and flexion extension lateral cervical spine x-rays just to look for um, lateral, uh, excuse me, anterior posterior uh, uh, subluxations because of loose ligaments on the spinal cord. 
Uh, there's some question as to whether or not uh, the brain MRI should be upright to allow full gravity to be pulling on the tissues. Um, that's still up to debate. A lot of this uh, treatment, neurosurgical treatment, is um, in the learning phase. Um, one provider who has done a lot of this work back east uh, requests getting rotational CT scans of the neck where you have them turn their head to the left 90 degrees and to the right 90 degrees um, so you can see if there's rotational instability as well. Uh, most of the time, they'll uh, uh, it, with these head as well. Uh, most of the time, they'll uh, uh, it, with these headaches. I usually refer them to a neurology or neurosurgical consultation based on the patient's symptoms. For the GI disorders, uh, usually initially treat with uh, GERD and hiatal hernia and IBS with diet changes and medications if symptoms are consistent with that. Uh, the, the main two other things to think about is gut motility and which would be um, the nausea and vomiting and bloating can cause a significant decreased quality of life. And so um, if the symptoms persist, we usually after GI consultation and scoping, they may need a gut motility test, which is the four hour gastric emptying study to rule out gastroparesis which has its own set of treatments. Uh, we also consider uh, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because of decreased gut motility. And that can also be helpful to treat that as well. Extremely important to treat uh, sleep as it affects all of the comorbidities. After normal sleep hygiene, consideration of sleep apnea. We can use melatonin or gabapentin, pregabalin, cyclobenzaprine. Uh, often if gastroparesis and or depression are present, I've had good success with mirtazapine. Trazodone or Belsomer are options as well. We can use benzodiazepines in Ambien or Ambien with caution if using opiates, uh, obviously. If the sleep uh, is not treated reasonably, really nothing else will improve the quality of life of these patients. Mast cell has talked about before is uh, you have too much histamine release, so daily prevention with second generation antihistamines such as loratadine in combination with H2 blocker. Uh, famotidine is often helpful. If that doesn't help after a couple months, I will add oral chromalin, which is uh, gastrochrome, which is a mast cell stabilizer. And oftentimes the three of these would be quite helpful. Neuropsychiatric, uh, when a correct diagnosis is made, validation of the patient's symptoms, it's a huge benefit for both the patient and the patient physician relationship. The patients will be very thankful that you listen to them and are able to point them in the right direction. Cognitive behavioral therapy is helpful. Can consider treating comorbidities like depression, pain, anxiety, and nausea with duloxetine and or Remeron. Can also use SSRIs. So I'm just gonna end with a couple of these hypermobile patients, like to kind of show off what they can do. This is a still picture um, of a patient. And this is a video which I will leave you with. Ouch. Okay, that concludes my talk on hypermobility. I thank you very much.